Good morning. Good morning to all of you. I welcome all of you to today's webinar on ethics in COVID-19. And it's my privilege to uh, say thank you to the panelist, Dr. Amal Hashadi Silla, Secretary to the State Ministry of Primary Health Services, Pandemics and COVID-19 Prevention. Dr. Ritsu, Mrs. Ritsu Nakin, Country Representative, UNFPA, and Dr. Deepa Gamage, Consultant Epidemiologist, Epidemiologist, Minister of Health, Professor Atula Sumati Pala, sir from Kiel's Unity UK, and got involved heavily in our COVID-19 preventive uh, actions. And uh, we expect Dr. Rasia Pense, Country Representative of WHO to attend the discussion. And uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, SLMA, and uh, Dr. Preeti Vijayagunavadana, President, Chair, sorry, the Chairperson of our Ethics Committee, SLMA, to come on stage. I invite Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President of SLMA, to give the opening remark and set the stage for today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Suranta. Uh, Dr. Amal Hasha, Secretary to the State Ministry of Primary Health Services, Pandemics and COVID-19 Prevention. Dr. Uh, hopefully, Dr. Azia Pinsi, who will be here to continue with the discussion. Dr. Ms. Rizunakin, Country Representative of UNFPA, Dr. Atula Sumatipala, Consultant Psychiatrist, Case University UK, Dr. Deepa Gamage, Consultant Epidemiologist, Unit of the Ministry of Health, Dr. Vinya Arya Ratna, Consultant Community Physician, President Sarvodhya Moment, Dr. Preeti Vichegunadhana, Chairperson of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Suranta, other council members who have gathered here, media and uh, distinguished invitees. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, at the outset, let me tell you, we have gathered here for an extremely important discussion in today's context. We are at the opening of the COVID Ethics in COVID-19, the webinar organized by the Ethics Expert, SLMA Expert Committee for Ethics on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. So I warmly welcome all of you for this webinar on behalf of the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Now, we have had many webinars with regard to COVID. Every now and then we had webinars, I mean, some were on management, some on vaccination and prevention. But the, today's webinar would be a little different because it would be ethics in COVID. And this is the very first of this nature of all the COVID webinars that were organized by many professional organizations. So now what are ethics? In general, the ethics are the sort of philosophical beliefs and the practices that are concerned <laughs> with the, the, I mean, in general, of the moral principles or con with concern with regard to rights and wrongs. So medical ethics, I mean, that we all are familiar with, is the moral principles that add value to our clinical practice and also for scientific research. Now, I mean, the ethics are something that is being taught to all medical students 
And as very basics of ethics, what we are taught is that ethics stand on four pillars. Basically, the non-malfeasance, beneficence, justice, and the, uh, the fourth one is uh, uh, autonomy, autonomy. Autonomy, non-malfeasance, beneficence, and justice. Those are the four pillars on which the ethics stand. So code of ethics for medical profession spanned, span from Hippocrates Oath from maybe, I mean, 400, 500 BC. Uh, so it, it has been going, I mean, it is, it develops throughout based on practices and based on the technology that has been introduced. And it is something that the, as medical profession, that we all the time have to be up to, uh, up to date. So it is in that context that I very much appreciate the uh, effort that is taken by the ethics committee of the Sri Lanka Medical Association to organize this very timely webinar on ethics in COVID. The COVID was something new to all of us. I mean, we, none of us had experienced any, any outbreak, any pandemic like COVID in our lifespan. So initially we saw that so much of violations or the uh, I mean, non-ethical conduct among medical profession, among the ordinary people as well as the media and they have so much of influence. So, I mean, as it says that there is a silver, every cloud is with the silver line, that this is the best opportunity for us to make use of this. And I'm sure that this uh, uh, ethics committee does not intend to finish this as sort of once and for all. It would be followed by another national concept, a national program that would be very important to uplift the ethical conduct of the medical profession that would benefit the profession as well as the community in this country. So based on that introduction, I, while I congratulate uh, Dr. Preeti Vijayagunavadana, Dr. Vinya Ariratna, Dr. Surantha, and the team that who took this effort, enormous effort in putting this today's webinar, uh, the, I mean, for us to conduct and uh, liaising, organizing this webinar, uh, I uh, very warmly welcome all of you to the SLMA auditorium for this webinar. Mata Singhaleng Machanathuna keyword, Sri Lanka Vaidya Sangame, Maging Vaidya Sangame, Sri Lanka Vaidya Sangame, Itama Vishala Ruksha Akwage. Eke eka shakavak bana, achara mabaidya, achara dharma velta, adala sanukamitua, mugging, other may webina me covid velta, adala, achara dharma kina, me tamatma, vadagat, matrika vatati, may webina eka apilastical latini. A Peter, other makers to Sakachakrana, there's galaxy of speakers who are with so much of experience and the knowledge on this subject. Apitame itamat daksha adakimbalin itamatma atidaksha me sampat me avastave mitana ikutu latinama me magin api vaidya prajavata avasha achare dharma padatia godanagala api eka lankavata madala jati etama vadagat vina Karta Vyak Vidihata, other Sri Lanka Vaidya Sangami Maging, Miyavasta Vidi, make a Karana, Balapurutu Enava. You think A Danum Dima, A Kitty Haduna Dima Tika, Mama Aradana Kranova. I very warmly welcome Dr. Vinya Ari Ratna to talk on. Are we concerned about ethics? in COVID-19. So over to you, Vinya. Uh, thank you very much, Madam. Um, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, Dr. Preeti Vijay Gunawadana, Chairman of the Expert uh, Committee on Ethics of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Um, 
Dr. Suranta Pereira, member of the um, Ethics uh, Committee, and uh, our distinguished uh, speakers uh, from the expert panel, uh, all the invi distinguished invitees, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and also I'd like to greet uh, those of you who are joining online. So I have been asked to um, actually provide kind of a preamble to this very important topic, uh, ethics in COVID-19. So uh, the, the theme that I have selected is, are we concerned about it? Uh, there's a question mark. That's why uh, I think we are discussing this, the level of uh, commitment or concern for this very important aspect. COVID-19 Acharya Dharma Mahitane Vaidhi Shetret Pamanak Nevi Samasthya Khatiyata Gatta Hama Hama Samaja Sanstava Katam Adalai. The NSA Sri Lanka Vaidhi Sangamaya Adha Utsaha Dharani E Acharya Dharma Pilibandha Visayasakya Kamitua Utsaha Gaya Gane Ame Pilibandha Ape Vaidhi Prajavita Vada Ani Yomukalla Eva Gema Visayasakya Tiran again, make reality nearly city in a Amadina Tama, me Pilimanda, Tamangi, Bumika, Pilimanda, and Matamataka, the Makala Dila, E Pilimanda, Kriat Makavina. So I would like to start my presentation by questioning who are we? Who are the people who should be concerned or who are concerned about ethical aspects related to COVID 19? Then what are some of these ethical considerations? And we know, as uh, Dr. Gunaratna mentioned earlier, that this is a very unprecedented health challenge. So it is not similar to what we have experienced uh, before, any type of natural or man-made disaster. So uh, should we be concerned of this particular aspect one year on? And what is the current sort of st status in Sri Lanka? And I'm not an expert on ethics. I am a practitioner of public health, a development worker as well, and I try to reflect from my own experience working with grassroots communities and what could be a way possible way forward. So I'll take only 10 minutes. Um, now we are one year on since the onset of the epidemic in Sri Lanka, and we have solid experience. I think we have achieved a lot as a country in containing the epidemic. And if you really look at the 12 month period, then we had the initial uh, stage, uh, the, the first wave, which was uh, from uh, late March up until uh, June. And then we had a, a interval there where we also lost our interest also in some, uh, to some extent. And there was a period of complacency. And since October, we have been facing the second, second wave. So if you look at the, the transition of the epidemic in Sri Lanka, uh, we uh, can look at our response as citizens, our response as public health practitioners. I, we can uh, look at the response of the international community, key players. Uh, so here, I think we already have quite a bit of solid experience uh, in how we dealt with the epidemic. Vasaraka Kalya to Lapita Luku Adaki Maktiana, then may Pasangate Sambanding, Api Kriat Makavicha, Akare Pilibanda, Api Pratichare, Wide the Prajava Hat Theatre, Himanatang, Api Saman, Janatava Hat Theatre, Himanatam make it a Samband, the Jatantar Parshavan Hat Theatre, Apiti Ampisi Adakima, may win a good Athena. So, based on this, if we look at uh, who we are, of course, this is driven primarily by health uh, policy makers and health practitioners because they are leading in the front. So they belong to both preventive and curative sectors and also to allopathic and Western systems of medicine and also state and private sector. Then policy makers are of course from the government side and also legislators, politicians are involved, then administrators, health and non-health administrators, then other stakeholders, importantly media, we have journalists, senior journalists who have been covering health related uh, topics throughout their career. And, you know, uh, I think Kumuduni is here who has done a piece every week, every Sunday Times uh, uh, column, where a balanced analysis of the COVID 19 situation has been reflected. But certain things have gone unnoticed and uh, not received the attention. Then there are other uh, stakeholders like the business community, religious leaders, citizens. We all, I think, they, they all have a stake in this. Make a partial car one Buddha kiti at a hamotem, make a bumika vaktino, a kilapi vishwas kanoa, achara dharma, sambandin. 
එතකොට අපි වෛද්‍ය මද්මගුණ රත්න මහත්මිය සඳහන් කළ ආකාරයට මේ ආචාර ධර්ම පොදුවේ ගත්තාම තියෙන ආචාර ධර්ම සහ වෛද්‍ය විද්‍යාත්මක ආචාර ධර්ම වල මූලික කාරණා තියෙනවා so we go back to the basics always we have to go back to basics to see whether we are really adhering to those so when you say autonomy it's the uh, it's the freedom of the patient to decide the type of treatment or other choices that uh, he has in terms of dealing with the health issue then also there has to be a benefit uh, to uh, the individual concerned and there has to be no harm and there has to be all our actions has to be have to be uh, based on justice then things like informed consent and confidentiality so we mean vaidya achara dharma vidyavata adalama nischitta moola dharmayan thiyena ewa api sahena durakata e ewata anugata wenawada kiyana eka api dannawa e wageyema visheshayenma rahasya bhave toruturu wala pawatwa gena yama e wageyema අවබෝධාත්මක කැමැත්ත ලබා ගැනීම යම් කිසි දෙයක් කරන්න කලින් ඒක පරීක්ෂණයක් වෙන්න පුළුවන් එහෙම නැත්නම් යම් කිසි විදිහක ප්‍රතිකාරයක් දීම වෙන්න පුළුවන් මේ වගේ මූලික ආචාර ධර්ම අපි වෛද්‍ය විද්‍යාවේ නිරන්තරයෙන්ම භාවිත කරනවා so if you look at the covid 19 situation if we look at of course who as the the lead organization in guiding us internationally Uh, WHO looks at four broad areas: resource allocation and priority setting, physical distancing, and all related uh, issues. Then public health surveillance, and of course those related to research that uh, govern healthcare workers' rights as well as obligations in the conduct of clinical trials. But beyond this, we see also uh, the challenges faced by different countries because of the socio-economic and cultural context, and from that one-year experience and. given us enough examples of where certain things have not gone well as we intended or we have just um, kept silent uh, there is sometimes even conspiracy of silence that we don't want to talk about it so there is a great need uh, to uh, ensure that there is proper guidance in research decision making in clinical care and public health policy making at every level of the global Uh, covid-19 response so we have technical agencies like who guiding us at the international level but at the local level we have to be finding solutions ourselves uh, which are appropriate for our context but certain fundamental principles of ethics will not change no matter which context in which you apply so uh, ethical consideration in covid-19 we know it's they are complex and we are also we have to remind ourselves that uh, the level of adherence to ethics in covid-19 situation also depends on how much we have been adhering to normal ethics before covid-19 so if our level of adherence to ethics generally as a society had been low or in the medical practice then of course we can't expect a lot even during uh, covid-19 time එතකොට මේ ආචාර ධර්ම පිළිබඳ කතා කිරීමේදී අපි මේ කොවිඩ් දහනමේට අදාළ ආචාර ධර්ම කතා කළත් අපිට ඊට කලින් ඒ කියන්නේ මේ කොවිඩ් දහනමේ වසංගතයේ තර්ජනය ලෝකෙට එන්න කලින් අපේ රටට එන්න කලින් අපේ කොච්චර විදිහ කොයි මට්ටමක ආචාර ධාර්මික වුණාද අපේ වෘත්තියන්හි වෛද්‍ය වෘත්තිය වෙන්න පුළුවන් වෙනත් ක්ෂේත්‍රයන්හි වෙන්න පුළුවන් ඒක බලපානවා අපි මේ වෙලාවේ කොයි විදිහට රටක් හැටියට ප්‍රතිචාර දක්වනවද කියන එකට ඒ නිසා අපිට අවශ්‍යයි ඊටම අවංක සහ සත්‍යවාදී වූ තක්සීරුවක් කරන්න අපි කොතනද ඉන්නේ කියලා. Therefore we need to have a honest appraisal based on evidence where we are. So far we have seen that uh, this has not received the priority that it deserves. මේකට ප්‍රමුඛතාවය ලැබිලා නැහැ කියලා අපි විශ්වාස කරනවා. ඒ නිසා විශේෂයෙන්ම ප්‍රජා වෛද්‍ය විද්‍යාවේ අපි වැඩ කරන අයවලුන් හැටියට අපි දකිනවා මේ පිළිබඳව වැඩි අවධානයක් යොමු කළ යුතුයි කියලා. So as public health practitioners we would very much like to see better prominence given and that's why the Sri Lanka Medical Association organized this seminar. This is just to start the conversation. This was 2 weeks ago. Colombo Municipal Well, Council Health Official have decided to conduct random checks at Golf Face Green this week for suspected COVID-19 cases. Uh, as they moved around, they spotted a couple relaxing under an umbrella. They conducted an antigen test and found that they were positive. 
it was then that the couple began pleading with the officials not to tell their parents but the officials had no option but to inform the parents before they were dispatched for quarantine so is there a ethical issue here then if you look at the uh, what, what happens when a negative pcr person is misdiagnosed and what that person has to go through on what the doctors are going through in managing this crisis there is covid fatigue now right so people can complain but our health staff is also stretched so they say that there needs to be a regular mechanism because such delays worsen the suffering for relatives uh, one doctor said and medical authorities are also under so much pressure we are handling multiple issues and the calls the complaints the grief all come to us etokot metana me covid 19 me wasangate sambandhi vividha tala walin vividha patikade angen aacharya dharma pilimada gatalu matu wenawa etokot meka tikak sankirnai e wageema visheshayenma me maraneta patwan sambandhin nathi vela thiyena tattwayat ekka e bhuma daane karanawa da daane karanawa da kiyana ekata amatharawa ඉතාම මේ මත බේදයට තුරු දෙන කාරණා ඇති වෙලා තියෙනවා ඔල්සෝ देयर ආ ඉෂුස් සීරියස් ඉෂුස් රිලේටඩ් ටු ඩෙත්ස් හැපනින් අවුට්සයිඩ් ද හොස්පිටල් ඇන්ඩ් විච් ආ නොට් සම්ටයිම්ස් රිලේටඩ් ටු කොවිඩ් 19 ඔර් ද කන්ෆියුෂන් දැට් ඉස් देयर විත් රිගාර්ඩ් ටු ප්‍රොසීඩියර්ස් දෙන් ඔල්සෝ දි ප්‍රැක්ටිකල් ඔපරේෂනල් තින් මෙසප්ස් දැට් හැපන් ඉන් ද පෙරිෆරි ඇන්ඩ් හව් ටු ඩීල් විත් දෝස් ඇන්ඩ් සම්ටයිම්ස් දේ ආ ඔල්සෝ Uh, professional opinion given they are discarded right so where do we stand sri lanka medical association gave very clear technical um, it took a stand on certain issues and made it public college of community physicians made uh, certain technical uh, uh, positions maintained and really made the uh, uh, press releases but they were not adhered to so uh, where do we stand isn't evidence not being listened to isn't that a ethical issue in the, in in this country then the whole um, the commercialization of the entire prevention process then there are sometimes also allegations of corruption and all that then also the issue of uh, sri lankan migrant workers who are trapped in the middle east the madha peradiga atharamangwela inna sri lankika and pirimanda wagakim api hariyatama danne na sankhyawa namuth e vividha kaanda walata ath aya innawa නීති අනුකූල වලියා පදිංචි වෙලා රැකියා වලට ගියපු අය සමහර අය ලියා පදිංචි වෙන්නේ නැතුව ගියපු අය නම මේ සියලු දෙනාම ශ්‍රී ලාංකිකව අද අසරණ වෙලා ඉන්නවා එතකොට ඒගොල්ලන්ට ආපහු එන්න අපි ගත්තොත් මෙන්න මේ වගේ මුදලක් වැය කරන්න වෙනවා ඇමරිකා වගේ රටක ඉඳලා ඉන්නවා නම් රුපියල් ලක්ෂ 5ක් විතර නමුත් මැද පෙරදික විශේෂයෙන්ම ලක්ෂ 2ක් 3ක් අතර එතකොට 27000ක් ඉන්නවා නම් මේගොල්ලන් ආපහු පැමිණෙන තෙක් ඒගොල්ලන්ගේ සෞඛ්‍ය ගැන යම් කිසි විදිහක අවධානයක් යොමු කරන්න අපිට සදාචාරාත්මක අයිතියක් නැද්ද so there are ethical issues related to returning migrant workers or repatriation of migrant workers and also the media reporting now this says that after may covid will be gone literally that's the literal translation in sinhala right so misinformation disinformation all that so if you consider all these things Uh, we can uh, really come up with a list of concerns right this may not be an exhaustive list and i like to start with the public health policy and it's it's such a coincidence uh, that uh, in uh, uh, 2019 november just a month before the epidemic started there was a uh, there was this sr kotigoda memorial oration by dr palita bekon and he touched on this uh, this very issue as if he had known that this pandemic was coming um and he he uh, emphasized on three core functions that are important in uh, public health ethics identifying and clarifying ethical dilemmas in policy formulation and practice that was his first uh, uh, point of emphasis then identifying alternative courses of action and their consequences we have to we are at a stage in our epidemiological uh, 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 epi, epi, epid uh, uh, curve in now sri lanka that we may need to modify some of our strategies then third resolving dilemmas by adopting the path that best balances the principles and values 
වෛද්‍ය පාලිතා අබේකෝන් මහතා මේ වසංගතයට මාස දෙකකට කලින් මේ ආචාර්ය ධර්ම සහ මහජන සෞඛ්‍ය කියන ප්‍රමුඛ දේශනයක් පැවැත්වුවා SR කෝට්ටේගොඩ මහාචාර්ය SR කෝට්ටේගොඩ අනුස්මරණ දේශනය. එතනදී මේ මහජන සෞඛ්‍ය ප්‍රතිපත්ති සම්පාදනයේදී ආචාර්ය ධර්ම වල වැදගත්කම සහ මේ මූලික වටිනාකම් සහ ප්‍රායෝගික තත්ත්වයන් සමබර කිරීමේ අවශ්‍යතාවය සහ වැදගත්කම අවධාරණය කළා. එතකොට මෙතනින් පටන් ගත්තාම අපේ නීරෝධායන ක්‍රියාවලිය ඉඳලා තාක්ෂණික කාරණා ගොඩක් සම්බන්ධයෙන් අපිට මේ ආචාර්ය ධාර්මික ප්‍රවේශය වැදගත් වෙන බව පෙන්වා දෙන්න පුළුවන් සෝ ෆ්‍රොම් කොරන්ටයින් ප්‍රොසෙස් ටු ටෙස්ටින් කන්ටැක්ට් ට්‍රේසින් ස්ටිග්මටයිසේෂන් ඔෆ් ඉන්ඩිවිජුවල්ස් වයලේෂන් ඔෆ් ප්‍රිවසි ඇන්ඩ් කොන්ෆිඩෙන්ෂියලිටි දෙන් එතික්ස් රිලේටඩ් ටු ට්‍රීට්මන්ට් ඇන්ඩ් පේෂන්ට් කෙයා මැනේජ්මන්ට් ඔෆ් ද ඩෙත් normal functioning of the routine preventive and curative health services and now of course the vaccine related it's not just in sri lanka but it all over the world we have the question of equity uh, those countries which are more powerful which are have, having more resources have better access but that's not uh, acceptable so you get the same uh, ethical dilemmas when it comes down to our uh, com- country level as well who should be given the priority then look at looking at it from a non uh, medical or it's also related but more from a social perspective uh, we see a, another set of issues here etukota eka patting api vaidya vidyaatmaka patting mahajana vaidya vidyaatmaka patting aragattahama thiyena aacharya dharmika e gatalu balata amathara api samajame vashin gattahama thawat apita godak කාරණ සඳහන් කරන්නට පුළුවන් especially media reporting coverage and social media which also is linked to misinformation and disinformation is it ethical for us to even as individuals pass on a message uh, or a whatsapp message that's not verified right uh, so uh, then of course stigma and discrimination and the in- differential impact of certain public health measures lockdowns they are necessary but can they are be mitigating Uh, uh, interventions that we can think of impact on vulnerable groups we know the plight of the children abuse that is uh, that are taking place uh, at home due to closure of schools and also the generally uh, corporal punishment to other forms of violence against children is very high in sri lanka then women differently abled elderly patients on treatment for chronic diseases including mental illness residents of care homes prisoners residents of uh, yeah it's uh, sorry it's uh, duplicated here and the migrant workers etukota visheshayma vividha kaanda innwa me arbudedi covid 19 me arbudedi peedawata patwecha etana samahara velawata apita visandum nathi prashnayak nevei thiyenne api ketek durata aachara dharmikada me prashna gena sangvedi vela api nirmana shile vela visandum hoyanna eka ma hitanawa aachara dharmika prashnayak kiyala the way forward then i'll conclude with this do we accept that uh, there are ethical issues in covid 19 that need to be addressed that need to be urgently addressed api etukota piligannawada me covid 19 ay vasangata palaneedi apita aachara dharmika karana sambandhin pramukhatavaya dilla katiyutu kirimi hadisi avashyathavaya tada bala avashyathavaya thiwenada kiyala however um, even though the uh, issues related to ethics in covid 19 extend beyond the realm of public health practice clinical care and research medical community bears the primary responsibility to give leadership to address the ethical issue that's my conviction etukota meke vaidya novana saukya ansha balata riju adala novana aachar dharmika patta tibuna apita avashyai me vaidya prajawa hatiyata mekata nayakatwe thima ඒ වගේම අපි හැම දිනාම වෛද්‍යවරු හැටියට දිවුරුමක් ගන්නවා අපි වෛද්‍ය සංගමයේ සභාපතිතුමිය මේක ගැන සඳහන් කරා හිපොක්‍රේටිස් දිවුරුම කියලා. එතකොට මේකේ මම මේ ඔක්කොම කියවන්න යන්නේ නැහැ මම මේක සිංහලෙන් කියවුවාම මේකේ මේ අන්තිම කෑල්ල මම ඒක විතරක් සඳහන් කරන්න. මම කුමන නිවසකට ඇතුළු වුණත් රෝගීන්ගේ හිතසුව පිණිස වැඩ කරන්නේ මම මේක ඉංග්‍රීසි පරිවර්තනයේ තියෙන්නේ ඒක අර මේ තුමේ කිව්වා වගේ අවුරුදු 500කට ක්‍රිස්තු පූර්ව 500 දී විතර මේක ලිව්වට ඒක විවිධ තත්යන් හිඳි ඒක අරගෙන තියෙනවා මේ විකාශනය වෙලා තියෙනවා නමුත් මේකේ මූලික හරය අරගත්තාම එන කරුණ තමයි මම සඳහන් කරලා තියෙන්නේ 
මම කුමන නිවසකට ඇතුළු වුණත් රෝගීන්ගේ සුවසෙත පිරිස වැඩ කරන්නේ මේ ඕන් වහලුන් වේවා නිදහස් පුර වැසියන් වේවා ඕන්ට හිතාමත අයුක්තියක් කිරීමෙන්ද හානිකර අන්දමින් ඕන් සමග ක්‍රියා කිරීමෙන්ද ස්ත්‍රී වේවා පුරුෂ වේවා ඕන් සමග ලිංගික සමරතා පැවැත්වීමෙන්ද වැලකි සිටින්නේ මේ එසේම මගේ වෘත්තියේ නිලත් නියලි සිටින විට ඕ වෙන යම් මොහොතකදී හෝ යමෙකුගේ ජීවිතේ පිළිබඳව කිසි සේත්ම ප්‍රසිද්ධිය ප්‍රචාරයෙන් නොකළ යුතු යමක් අසන්නට හෝ දකින්නට ලැබුණොත් ඒ රහසිගතව තබා ගැනීමට ලබාගත යුතු දෙයක් ලෙස සලකමින් නිහඬව සිටීමට පොරොන්දු වෙමි ඊළඟට අපි මේක අවසන් කරන්නේ I will not translate this into English because most of the doctors know this and they have taken this oath මාමේ දිවුරුම උල්ලංඝනය නොකොට පවත්වා ගතහොත් මට සතුටින් දිවි ගෙවීමටත් මගේ ශාස්ත්‍රය යහමින් කරගෙන යෑමටත් ලැබේවා සියලු මිනිස් වර්ගයා ඉදිරියේ කීර්ති නාමයක් දිනා ගැනීමේ ගෞරවය මට ලැබේවා මා විසින් මෙම දිවුරුම උල්ලංඝනය කරනු ලැබුවොත් හෝ වංක ලෙස දිවුරුම් දෙනු ලැබුවොත් ඊට ප්‍රතිවිරුද්ධ දෙයම මට සිදු වේවා so i think this gives the spirit of the hippocratic oath so the sri lanka medical council i must remind to particularly the young doctors that they take this oath when they uh, are registered as medical practitioners i will maintain by all means all the means in my power to and the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession i'll not permit considerations of religion nationality race party politics party politics caste of social standing to intervene between my duty and my patient i will maintain the utmost respect for human life from its beginning even under threat we are under threat we are under lot of pressures from various parties but we have to keep our heads up and stand for what's right in containing the covid 19 and i will not use my medical knowledge contrary to the laws of humanity this photograph i think will win an award this was uh, in the mahara what is this lady asking this po a poor policeman doesn't look at her because he he can't connect with the eyes of this poor woman a mother of a detainee so social justice is the foundation should be the foundation of our response then we can achieve arogya paramalabha which is health is the highest gain in life thank you thank you dr vinayari ratna for that very informative lecture and uh, highlighting one of the points i read from one of the publication recent publications people should be treated as morally equals worthy of respect while individuals may be asked to make sacrifices for the public good the respect due to individuals should never be forgotten in the way in which interventions such as quarantine and self isolation are implemented so opening for the second phase of our webinar uh, we will invite each panelist to make a small speech under given set question for around 5 minutes and then later on the uh, all of us can join for a discussion so first i like to invite Dr. Amal Harsha Dishila, Secretary to the State Ministry of Primary Health Services, Pandemics and COVID-19 Prevention. Yes, sir. Chairperson of SLMA, Dr. Padma Gunratna, dear friend Preeti Abhay Gunratna, and Suranta Pereira, who has organized this, country representative of WHO, Razia Prince, and from the other, all the league race here. And I think, you know, when I listen to this, uh, first episode of vinyar ratna thought that you know we got to look back in certain things that we are doing on a day to day basis i would like to thank the slma for getting this on the agenda and you know when we do things in the ministry sometimes you know we are also fire fighting and and many things we also think that you know, we should have looked back little bit most ingently when we think about the situation when it comes to you know ethics or the moral behavior i think you know uh, it, um, this is a very very sensitive area of action you know we all want everybody to be behaving ethically and you know in in all spheres of life when it comes to me it should be me and it cannot do any harm 
as far as we, we are concerned. If it's a medicine which is giving cure for 100,000 people and there's one fatality, we consider that as a safe medication. But that one person, one person cannot be me. That's expectation of the public. Therefore, I think, you know, this is when, when it comes to ethics, equal treatment for equal need is ethics. Unequal treatment for unequal need is also becoming part of the part of our ethics. Therefore, it's a very sensitive area. I think we need experts like you to help us, the ministry, to look back and reflect as to what's happening and see what, what actions that should be strengthened, what actions that should be cast away, uh, to remove the actions, and then what are the opportunities in the whole thing of this pandemic or epidemic in trying to do what we are doing today a little bit better tomorrow. That's the whole idea of what you are doing today. Therefore, we would like to listen to you, listen to get the expert uh, evidences, to look at very critically as to what's happening in the society and what's happening at, at all levels of care in trying to prevent this epidemic spreading. We have seen many, many behaviors of the providers as well as recipients of care, which is not, you know, uh, which is not ethical in, in, in many aspects. But of course, when it's highlighted also, it prevents, it, it creates a breach of ethics in that sense. Now, this, therefore, it's very, very, not very simple in our approach. You know, there are wants, there are needs, there are demands, and there are also unrealistic expectations when it comes to continuum of things that people need. Therefore, when we really see, ethics is very, very complicated subject. But in the meantime, it also can be very simple because we all human beings, we all would like to be treated in respectful manner and give respect to get respect. And therefore, I think I would like to salute the Sri Lanka Medical Association. It's a very opportune topic. We get so many calls on a day-to-day -day basis about individual issues and then try to get some redress. And then we always say equal treatment for equal need. And then, you know, we can make exceptions sometimes. And therefore, I would like to strongly, uh, I'm awaiting for what you see from, from your own eyes and then to see how we could as a ministry adapt what you say and then also make, make our situations much better in time to come on a, on a continuous quality improvement basis. Thank you very much. All of us know the important role played by WHO in the battle against COVID-19. And when we talk about solidarity, solidarity is crucial at the international level between governments in support from the state of, for those bearing the cost of interventions by business in how they exercise their corporate social responsibility. And at the individual level, in the way we all respond to the outbreak in day-to-day -day life, I kindly invite Dr. Rasia Pense, country representative, WHO. To Sorry, Rasia. Uh, you know, it's, uh, just invited to make some words in Sinhala. ධර්මයන් Sri Lanka, Vaidya Sangami, Sabhapati, Padma Gundra, the Matinata, Sahami, 
ආචාර ධර්ම සම්බන්ධයෙන් ඉන්න කමිටුවේ සභාපති ප්‍රීති අබේගුණවද මැතිතුමාටත් සුරන්ත පෙරා මැතිතුමාටත් ඒ අනිකුත් සියලුම ඒ සහ සම්බන්ධ වෙන සියලුම අයට මගේ ස්තුතිය පිරිනමනවා මොකද අපි දන්න ඕනම විවේචනයකදී මුලින්ම අමතක වෙන්නේ ආචාර ධර්ම ඒක සුරැකීම මම ඉතින් අපි සියලු දෙනාගේ මේතුකමක් ඒ ඒක ඒ සුරැකීම සදහා ඉදිරිපත් වීම සම්බන්ධයෙන් මම සියලු දෙනාට ස්තුතිවන්ත වෙමින් තමුන් වහන්සේලා ඒ කියන යෝජනා කරන දේවල් අපි හැකිතාක් දුරට අම්මාත්‍යාංශයේ වශයෙන් අපි ඒවා සලකා බලන බවත් ඒවා ක්‍රියාත්මක කරන්න සෑම උත්සාහයම දරන බව පවසමින් මගේ වචන සුරකා වසන් කරනවා ස්තුතියි නැවතත් අප ස්තුතිවන්ත වෙනවා වෛද්‍ය අමල් හර්ෂ දිසිල මැතිතුමාට එම අදහස් ප්‍රකාශ කිරීම සම්බන්ධයෙන් සිංහල භාෂාවෙන් so we kindly invite dr rasia pense country representative who to address you and the given topic is ethics in the global picture thank you dignities on the desk participants senior officials from various departments my colleague ruth sunakan from the nfta um a very good afternoon indeed it's a very timely topic when you talk about uh, cons- ethical considerations in the covid-19 response what constitutes ethics what a ethical framework should be like most of the points have been uh, already touched upon by the previous speakers one thing which is the additional complexity of a pandemic response is that in an emergency what we don't have is time and for emergency response speed trans perfection and most of the times during an emergency response so we talked about beneficence maleficence do no harm which is the centrality of the hippocratic oath in an emergency response there also a clause no regrets and that we do not just for the pandemic response even in emergency you know rooms in emergency management patients coming we try our best and that is very important so how do we balance this that we need to have an absolute perfect response or we need to have an immediate response and as i said in emergencies speed trumps perfection what is most important is to move fast because time is not on our sides and if we wait for a perfect response we would actually be doing a disservice in terms of the emergency response so for people who are looking at you know coming up and it doesn't mean that this should not be ethical ethics is non negotiable it has to happen oh sorry there was a stop in terms of the global pandemic response right from the beginning a none of us had expected that we will enter 2020 in this manner that this year would be one of its kind an unprecedented global pandemic which would impact lives and livelihoods across the globe no country has been left untouched no individual has been left untouched all the assessments that were done in terms of the health systems capacity the various ratings of the emergency response ihr core capacities when we look at how the pandemic has unfolded and yesterday i was reading an article in the atlantic which is on bhutan and how that small country has managed the pandemic the first death due to covid-19 in bhutan happened on 7th of january and that's the only death reported this is an interesting article to read because there are lessons learned from all across the countries the country with the best systems intensive care management that is united states of america has reported the most number of deaths so it's it really brings to bear the notion about how do we what are the lessons learned of the from the pandemic and moving forward how do we use these lessons not just for the pandemic preparedness but our ethical equitable preparedness for emergencies but when we prepare for emergencies it actually stems from how good our foundational systems are and what we need to invest so have the health systems to be resilient to be sustainable 
and that can match up to the needs when a distress happens and distress of this magnitude. So in, in, in a nutshell, it's important that we learn from the response this time. No response is perfect. There's always multiple lessons learned for it. In terms of the global uh, pandemic and what, uh, sorry, the ethical, the ethics in the response of the COVID-19, Dr. Vinay Ariratne pulled out, you know, some of the ethical considerations for the pandemic response. Now, when we look at ethics, sometimes ethics and research is something which is much well-defined. Most of the countries have an ethical framework for research. Any research protocol has to go through an ethics review committee. That system is not as robust in other parts of the response. So when we look at the COVID-19 and the ethics, the areas which WHO has picked, out, picked up for ethical considerations, of course, research tops the table. And especially in the context of a pandemic, a new virus but no diagnostic, no therapeutics, let alone vaccines. You need to design clinical trials, which have to be ethical. There has to be a fast review of protocols. So how do we do it? There were discussions on human challenge studies for therapeutics, for vaccines. So what ethical framework should be like? So research is one very important aspect on ethics, but also resource allocation. How do you have an equitable resource allocation? And resources are not just financial resources, they are human resources, medical products. And these days we are hearing a lot about vaccine nationalism and equitable access to vaccines moving forward. Priority setting, what do you prioritize? And there was always this discussion about economy and health. And for me, it's a no brainer. It's not either or, it's both together. Public health is a conduit to economic recovery because we cannot have economic recovery without looking at the foundational public health response. So sometimes, but when we sit in different fora, these kind of false you know, equivalences or dichotomies are brought out. So how do we have a framework which addresses these dichotomies? In terms of clinical management and guidelines, in an evolving research scenario, because 13 months into the pandemic. Still, we do not have a clear treatment guidance on it. Most of these because, okay, repurposing of antivirals, monoclonals, a repurposing of antimalarials, immunomodulators, lots have been uh, you know, researched and published. And one say, okay, use this and then say, okay, now a big trial has come, this is not good. How do we move forward? And then all these things, okay, a particular a hospital is giving this medication, the other is giving others. So I think so having a ethical lens in terms of the national guidance and how do you monitor those guidance in clinical practice and most of you are also clinicians in the room because prescription is a very individual uh, you know, uh, intervention. While there may be guidance for it, there is always an experience and clinical experience sometimes do not, cannot be quantified in terms of research and evidence, but that's important. How do we bring it together? SLMA is actually very well placed to bring even these clinical experiences, which may have not gone through a rigorous clinical protocol and design in terms of evidence synthesis. Then there has been a lot of emergency use of newer therapeutics. And like, for example, the vaccine that was brought in Sri Lanka was emergency use authorized while it did not have a WHO EUL, which is one of the things that the NMRA looks at. But then there was a mechanism that if it's emergency use authorized by a stringent regulatory authority can move forward. And having that clear communication to the public because a lot of questions are asked. Are you getting the right thing? Is it the best for us? Is it an alternative? How do we do it? So communication is also ethical delivery of interventions because most of the questions as Dr. Vinyari that brought out, sometimes that comes out in media are also either because of ignorance or, or the propelling of misinformation and disinformation. And mind you, this is the first pandemic in the age of social media. So there's a huge amount that we have to learn. 
on how do we have then fair allocation. So for WHO, we are looking at the global aspect. So the ACT accelerator, which is access to COVID technologies, both diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. And then for the vaccines is the COVAX pillar, because it's important that few people who are the most vulnerable get the vaccines in all the countries. So that is critical to the pandemic response. If all people in a few countries get it, we will never turn the tide on this pandemic. So how do we do it? And it's a very, very difficult uh, conversation to have. And you've heard our Director General Tedros talking about the moral obligation or the moral failure in terms of equitable distribution. So in a nutshell, moving forward, and while we talk about what is not happening, I think so it's also important to bring out what is happening. Closer home in Sri Lanka, with the universal care framework, the access to the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV diagnostics, therapeutics, and now with vaccination. This is free at the point of service delivery to all those who access these services in the public sector. This is a, a very strong foundation to build on and build it better and stronger. Because even during lockdowns, the government had worked on Ministry of Health on ensuring access to essential medicines, either partnering with the post office or with others or with private pharmacies, especially for medications for chronic illnesses. This was there. It's important for the public to know that this is also happening and also a mechanism for feedback from the public. That's the one missing piece in the response because communities have been looked upon as recipients of the response rather than as active participants and actors in the response. And this is very, very critical in a pandemic that is evolving in the absence of well-established diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. These are all things which we are implementing with a very short span of time that otherwise would take years in terms of research and delivery. So it would be moving forward, I think so, one thing is important is that there's a huge amount of experience and lessons learned from the pandemic in terms of having the ethical research. So from the WHO perspective, if of the ethical framework globally, there are uh, some resources already available. So the network of WHO collaborating centers, and we have a few here, that would be something. The national ethical committees, there is also a network so it's important to also tap upon those. And there is a public health emergency preparedness and response ethics framework, which is a global community of bioethicists. I think so it's a very good resource to tap upon because they actually provide real time, trusted and contextual support for communities, policymakers, researchers and responders on ethical issues. There's already some foundational work that has been done on ethics in research in the country. And that could be used to kind of further expand to also uh, clinical practice, to public health interventions like contact tracing. So there have been a few guidance that has come out from WHO on um, ethics. So one is the emergency use designation, uh, 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 the emergency use uh, designation of COVID-19 candidate vaccines. There's another one, because especially when we talk about uh, placebo controlled trials. So should you give a placebo when you have a vaccine and a candidate vaccine, which is still in evolution, then there has been this kind of thing about uh, unblinding the uh, results of the trial, because it's important for a faster approval and to get the, the data in real time. Then ethical considerations to guide the digital, uh, uh, the, the digital information and tracking because for the COVID-19 surveillance, we have, there's been a lot of use of digital tools and the privacy and confidentiality of individual personalized information. So there's guidance on that. And there's guidance on research ethics as well as human challenge studies. So there are multiple resources that are available. And within, in Sri Lanka, there is already work that has been done in the past couple of years on uh, the National Health Research Council Act in the code of 
for development and publication of the code of conduct on health research in Sri Lanka. And it has all the guiding principles that we have discussed about. And it would be good to uh, look into the health research governance strategy. A draft is already available. That how do we expand it to a response to the pandemic and perhaps overall uh, health systems response, even in a uh, kind of a steady state. Thank you very much. So the next question we want to draw your attention is, when we make ethical decisions, uh, policy decisions, do we care about gender, the rights of individuals, and do we leave certain subgroups behind, like uh, people who have disabilities? The best person to answer this question is Mrs. Rishunakin, country representative from UNFPA. So I'm glad to invite her to come and ask that question. Distinguished uh, doctors on the head table, distinguished uh, guests, um, colleagues from the UN, including uh, Dr. Razia. Um, we are very happy to be part of this uh, panel and uh, really honored as UNFPA to represent and talk about the most vulnerable and particularly women and people with disabilities. But uh, first, before I get into the issue of gender and disability, let me share some thoughts about uh, more broader ethics and the COVID. I think I totally agree with the Dr. Padma earlier mentioned that uh, this is also an opportunity to address ethics in society and uh, medicine. And I really think it's an important point. The two phrases I keep hearing in the press conference of the Dr. Tedros and other forum, also Dr. Razia have been saying, uh, one is uh, nobody is safe until everyone is safe. And the second one is virus does not discriminate. And what do these two phrases tell us? It is really about equality. And it is about rights-based approach. And it is about not leaving uh, anyone behind. And this is an opportunity to really make sure that everyone, literally everyone, has to have access to services. And we didn't have this kind of opportunity before. So we need to recognize that uh, as much as this is a tragedy and we are all tired of wearing the masks and so on. I think it's a tremendous opportunity. The second thing I want to raise is the dilemma between the public safety and the individual rights. And Dr. Razia mentioned earlier the dilemma or dichotomy between speed and perfection and uh, economy and health. And these are often talked about, but there's also the issue about public safety versus individual rights. And I think in many countries are feeling that we should lean towards public safety at this point to save lives, and that makes sense. But uh, I think as a ethical perspective, it's also important that we don't over restrict individual rights. And we always think about the most vulnerable be protected. And I think this is another sort of food of thought that we need to always take into consideration. Um, coming back to the gender and uh, uh, disability issues, um, this pandemic really brought in light the structural and long-standing discrimination and the uh, inequality between gender and other uh, social variants. And um, one is that the uh, society's reliance on women was really highlighted. And we all know that the majority of healthcare workers are women. And also in many countries, the essential workers such as cleaners, uh, people who work in the supermarket or the pharmacies, those are often women. And we need to really think about their well-being. We all know the strategy, I think, not only the US, but it was highlighted in the US, some healthcare workers are committing suicide 
it's too stressful and their well-being are not taken care of. And we always need to think about these workers' uh, well-being, both physical and mental health, as well as reproductive needs um, as from a duty of care and the rights-based approach perspective. The second is more broader economic impact on women. We all know that women are in a, uh, improportionately affected by economic impact. My home country in Japan, the suicide among women are increasing. And after the first uh, lockdown last year, it increased by 15%. And it is, I mean, uh, there are research, many research on this issue and it's still the verdict is not out. But it, it's partly because that women are often in the more unstable jobs, they lose jobs or they're single mothers and they have more uh, economic impact. Another aspect to this is that access to technology. A lot of services move from a uh, physical services to the virtual services. And then the people who don't have access to uh, technology very often more women are in this category, will have uh, deprived of the access to services. The other issue that is more well known by now is the gender-based violence. And this lockdown and the constraints, uh, const uh, restriction on the movements have really made women to be more vulnerable and particularly those who are living in a house, household where you have perpetrators at home. And this is not an issue that is unique to any country across the world. We have seen the numbers uh, of the calls to the hotlines for the gender-based violence and the domestic violence increasing uh, exponentially. Um, lastly, I want to really highlight the, the access to sexual and reproductive health issues and this is uh, again uh, often considered secondary needs, but if you think about uh, women of the reproductive age, and particularly those with the disabilities, their SRH needs are really fundamental in their life. And if you are on the pill and you can't buy them, what do we do? And it is really a really important aspect of the health services. Yet we saw already in the natural disaster situation that what people think, we oh, don't talk about contraceptives in this kind of situation. But no, I think we really need to listen to the women's voice and particularly women is not the homogeneous group. So particularly those with the disability, migrant women and other uh, women who are in the more precarious situations. Um, Reflecting on the, the point I made, this uh, public safety versus individual rights, I, I really uh, call for the attention of the medical practitioners as well as policymakers to think this issue through. I do believe that uh, in order for us to really leave no one behind, we need to still, even in this emergency, or especially in this emergency, we need to think about rights of individual as an important aspect of our recovery and the response efforts. Thank you very much. So uh, if we talked about some of the questions uh, are being asked, especially in this month, most important key area we uh, people are discussing is uh, vaccination in COVID-19. So we have invited Dr. Deepa Gamage, who is at the forefront of the vaccination program to address some of the issues, especially ethics in vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Suranta and uh, Dr. Patma Gunratna, president of the SLMA and Dr. Preeti Vijayakunathana, president of the uh, ethics committee SLMA and the Dr. Suranta uh, Pereira, Secretary to the uh, Ethics Committee SLNA, uh, and Dr. Amal Hashadi Silva, the Secretary to the Ministry of uh, State Ministry of Primary Health Services. Uh, 
Dr. Rasha Prince, the country representative WHO, and uh, Ms. Ritsu Nakin, the country representative UN UNFPA, and Professor Atul uh, Sumitipala, the Kiel's University UK, as well as an eminent uh, Prof, uh, the, the, the eminent profession who uh, helped us in Sri Lanka for a lot of sit, uh, difficult situations. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, those who have gathered here and also joined with us online. So when we talk about this uh, vaccination, it is very important to uh, consider these ethics because when we are talking about one uh, treating a patient, they are ill people, there are some ethics applied for them also. But when we are talking about the vaccination, then we are treating a population. It is not targeting for one person, but it is targeting for a larger population. The other difference is when we are treating a patient, they are ill people, they are looking for something to get cured. But for this normal other the, the vaccination, we are mainly focusing for normal population. Then we are trying to prevent getting them ill. So a lot of ethics are applied in uh, this vaccination, uh, uh, introducing a vaccination. And also before introducing a vaccination, I would like to draw your attention for some ethical considerations in uh, developing a vac uh, vaccine in a pandemic situation as well as uh, the, the, some, doing some research in developing the vaccination. So there, is, there are a lot of ethical considerations. I think Dr. Rashia has already uh, addressed some of them. Uh, and the other thing is uh, manufacturing. So technology transfer for manufacturing uh, after developing the vaccine. So manufacturing process also a lot of ethics are applied. And uh, after that, the vaccine implementation side. So I'm mainly focusing on different aspects of the vaccine implementation side, because we are uh, been considering the Sri Lankan aspect, the vaccine development and the vaccine manufacturing is uh, so far not much applicable because the vaccine trials have not conducted for this COVID-19 situation in Sri Lanka, as well as the uh, any technology transfer to our any manufacturing agency has not happened yet. Because of that, I mainly consider the vaccine implementation side, but kind of ethical considerations do we have to consider in vaccine implementation? Then we have to think of when the implementation to a um, uh, main program or into the country, we have to consider the personal choice versus the greater public good. So it is very important to uh, consider the personal interest, whether to accept the vaccine or not, the personal uh, requirement to get the vaccine versus the country requirement of the uh, greater public good to the greater population. So that is very important. Then protection of the risk population or the vulnerable population in considering the vaccination. So application of, to the greater population considering risk categories. So the prioritization comes there to how to, if we don't have the ability to give the equal uh, uh, vaccination to everybody in the country, then we, we have to consider the greater risk categorize a vulnerable population with a greater risk and how to give the uh, consider the public health uh, requirement to prevent the transmission or the protect the most vulnerable in that we can uh, identify the prevention of transmission to other people and reduction of the morbidity and mortality. So a lot of ethics are applying in identifying uh, these uh, priority groups. In, the, in the same way, the country is having a, a, a quarantine act, the mandate for vaccination. That is also important. But at the moment, we have a vaccination policy for the country, but enactment is not there. So I think that also can come in the future when consider the, uh, considering the uh, personal uh, choice versus the um, uh, greater public uh, good. So we, when you consider that, the enactment or the mandate for the vaccination also might have to consider in future. 
in that case also we have to think about the uh, uh, medical contraindications even though the mandate is there are the medical contraindications the ethics will apply on that aspect also uh, the exceptions for the vaccination and the second aspect i would consider in the implementation is the informed consent so informed consent can be a verbal consent or the written consent how the people perceive on uh, accepting the vaccination based on uh, they are knowing knowing on the vaccine information as well as um, uh, the contraindications and the side effects that is very important then the communication comes there how to the professional communications the medical aspect of conventional scientifically uh, uh, scientific facts communicate to the public in a simple way the way they can i they, they can uh, uh, the, the, they can uh, identify what kind of con, uh, side effects i can get and how i can uh, respond to that and what kind of contraindications are there why it is not provided to them so i think the informed consent is very important uh, the the in a way that the are we uh, consider that may uh, the uh, uh, giving the adequate information to the public through different channels through media person to person Uh, providing the information sheets or the um, posters or the leaflets so different way how to provide the information so ethics are applied in there also in providing the actual correct information and prevent the miscommunication so the misinformation and the third aspect i would consider is the access to access to vaccine so equal access equal or the equitable access to vaccine so then the again we consider some ethics on the identifying the priority groups as well as make it available in a, um, the all geographic areas as well as the easy access to vaccination centers so even if, if you make it available and people can't access there then they are also it is also uh the some ethics are applied whether it is the government will be providing but how they can get it if the transport is not there the distance is high and they are not uh, providing it easy access to people then that the ethics are applied in there also and i think it is the responsibility of uh, the stakeholder all the stakeholders to address on that to provide it at a uh, easy access access issues address on the access issues and the, then the social justice comes there if it is not provided i think the other other point i uh, wanted to uh, address was the emergency use licensing when the who pre qualification is not there but i think because dr raj has already addressed to that i will not going into uh, uh, in detail for that so these are the main uh, ethical issues comes in different areas of the vaccination vaccine manufacturing research aspect vaccine manufacturing technology transfers and the implementation thank you very much thank you deepa deepa and the final question we like to answer is uh, the question is uh, what is the role of ethics in emergencies epidemics emergencies and disasters when it come to research surveillance and patient care so i like to invite professor atul sumati pala uh, professor of psychiatric care chairman of the national institute of fundamental studies which is endos as he is endos as expert in bioethics by unesco and other world organization i think uh, professor atul sumati pala so is the best to answer that question dr padma gundra president of slma Dr. Preeti Vijayakanthan, Chairman of the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Suranth Pernetarist, save my five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I feel like I'm having a bit of a deja vu film hall. We spoke about ethics at that time. I was at King's College London. Today I'm here, so it's a bit deja vu. Now, when it comes to As Dr. Rashia Pence said, this is a 
pandemic, global pandemic, unprecedented. It's a very complicated thing. And to complicate it, as you already said, the infodemic has contributed and it's very complex. Golia Vasangata Tatwe, Atise Sankirana, it has a Palamara Tapi Katwinine, Ekatavat Sankirana Kalatina, Torotur Vasangate we sing. We are talking, gathering here in that context. I congratulate you all again. It's very timely. Thank you very much for taking this up. It's very, very, very close to my heart. When it comes to ethics, we know, I don't like to look at papers and read, but because the five minutes I'm doing it, I'm not used to this. Ethics uh, is a very widely wide subject, as we know, political ethics, media ethics, you name it. Medical ethics is only one, but we have to remember that moral rights and wrongs are not universal. They are not universal. So right and wrong is a very relative term for different, different people, different, different nations, different, different cultures. And unfortunately, the ethics field of ethics is dominated by Euro-American thinking. We have to be mindful about it. We have completely sort of ignored, forgotten that even in Islam there is ethics, Buddhism there is ethics, and, and in many religions the philosophy is based on ethics. So with that background I would like to remind you we don't have to reinvent the wheel as Dr. Pence said very correctly, ethics in epidemics, emergencies, disasters, research, surveillance, and patient care. I was fortunate to be part of this. So I'm, I'm very familiar with this whole thing, which has discussed all this. And I also want to tell you the complex emergency we are facing today is faced by another challenge. We know there's a thing called 90-10 divide. Healthcare provision, healthcare funding, Research and research publications are hugely divide. 90% of the globe get only 10% of this health funding, health research, health publication. I'll give you, because I'm a scientist, I believe in uh, evidence. We analyzed five leading journals in psychiatry 20 years ago to show only 6% of research come from 90% of disease burden countries. We thought it is because of psychiatry. We went and analyzed New England Journal, JAMA, British Medical Journal, Lancet, to find the same thing, 90% of knowledge come from 10% disease burden countries. We repeated all that last year. It has increased to 20%. However, it's still a huge divide. Remember, in this global pandemic, we don't even have that knowledge. That's what Dr. Asya Pence said. So we are challenged with this enormous gap. And that's why we have to rely on expert opinion. As she very correctly pointed out everybody, expert opinion is not necessarily right. There could be a difference of opinion, and that expert opinion shouldn't be and cannot be a prejudiced personal opinion. Somebody hold, even at up to delusional levels, fixed. There are ego issues. There are boundary protection issues we have to give up. We have to do the best for public good. That is what I strongly believe as ethics. Therefore, there is a huge role for ethics. Can ethics uh, research? Can research be done in uh, ethically? Yes. Ethics can be done uh, ethically. Uh, research can be done ethically. Komudunu, you will remember in 2005, we went to towns on parachute research. Fortunately, this is a global pandemic. So the parachuting is less. So therefore, people are protected. I'm a strong believer in research. But at the same time, the other side of the coin is ethics. You can observe ethics while doing good research, which is hugely needed. And there are... Go, uh, golden rules, you can get expedited review, that is not getting the, the, the review uh, process through the back door. Rajarata University of Sri Lanka, I'm sure even the SLMA has expedited review process. So I'm a strong advocate of doing research. In fact, I'm grateful to the WHO. They have funded us to follow up the 60 plus uh, 6,000 6, sample uh, to do a big project, particularly on resilience, coping and things like that. The main difference as we have spelled out in this document, the main difference between ethics in surveillance and research, both are more or less same, but, but you don't need informed consent for surveillance. That's the thing, it's, it's very clearly spelled out in this, it's, it's in the public domain. Now, the other point I want to make, ethics should be beyond philosophy. 
It has to be for policy impact. I'm a strong believer in that as well. So remember, ethics is always to do with power and injustice. This is not what I'm saying. Jaiva achara dharma ni me achara dharma kyanye balayata saha asadharatyata erahiva phela gesu no. Eka philosophy eka darshanya akpa muna kuya no haki. Eka janata wa samaga badda vecha kriya karitu ya kwen no. Ehe man etta ngwenya pita sakaccha mesa valta pamana mewa sima karaneka. Can a disaster, complex disaster be used as a window of opportunity for public and policy impact? Yes. That's my personal opinion. We left no un stored unturned at that time. I'm glad to say even the Disaster Act has ethics, research in it. You can go and refer back. Thanks to SLM even at that time, we managed to contribute. We believed not only in that, Gauravaniya Bhumadhaniya was a sankalpe at that time, reopening schools, not making them as makeshift camps, so we have an absolute moral ethical obligation and duty to make sure that we do all that. So I'm going to finish soon, not going to take time. Never compromise on ethical obligations, even at gunpoint. Don't give up. Don't give up. A good ethicist, good scientist, good academic shouldn't only have a heart and a powerful brain, but should have a strong spine and a thick skin as well. Because when you confront power and injustice, Make a api balakurutu in a janata vatakal haki sevia karanapuluang accountability. When we reviewed the whole uh, strategy recently, the theme came up repeatedly was accountability. We are accountable. Everybody who draws a salary in this, in, in this country are accountable to people. You are paid by the taxpayers' money. Janata vage badu mudalvaling vatup gan api sielu dena karane wagaki maki and kamatakiaga nona. Ekape boomi kava, ekape aitiwasi kamatawada, you took kamasaha, wagaki maki and kamawada, nikalakin awasana was saying. Equity and equality is two different things. You would see by providing eka ikawage, kotang tunak, dunakiela, usa, venas tunak, tiena kenekota, e ayata samana was halakuata eva de kirena, samana at mataveki and ing, obata gia katandrea, rupial panda hamatamata keno. Honda Carvaling Avila, legend to a Panda Harang Gedragia. Eka equality unata, eka equity name, a Panda hang Nati Berimini Hakuta, eka denati one of a make of home of a Hadili of Pena me, Chitraveling. Pala Vivida Gasakiata, a Pala Nilagan, then not a make of a game on the Kaduna de Katuta Kerena. Have I Sadar Natavene made a man etica Kiela. Can we do it? Yes, we can, provided we do it together. Professional organizations like the SLMA has a noble duty to play in this a somewhat neglected topic, ethics. As I always say, remember, we are just drop of an ocean, but together we can make a difference. Go over it, go under it, go around, go through, but never give up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that thought-provoking uh, small speech. And finally, we are moving to the uh, most expected uh, part the, our, in this webinar, the discussion. So uh, now the audience can ask any questions. I think uh, COVID-19 pandemic has brought all frontiers under one roof. And you can see the most eminent speakers, most uh, uh, who should be here? Ah, here, and then the, you can ask uh, questions. And uh, finally, we like to forward a letter requesting to uh, have an ethics committee at national level uh, in COVID-19 uh, when we are discussing about COVID-19. Thank you. Yes, we are talking about ethics. We have been talking about ethics since the tsunami. 
and all the natural disasters. I would like to just ask one question. Professor Atula said, equitable and equality. Why was the priority list for vaccines changed? Was that ethical? I will, I will just give a background. I have been following this for one year and I have been writing about the priority list since vaccines were spoken about. And in my view, and I have gone on record in the Sunday Times writing this, the priority list was frontline health workers, frontline security force workers, over 60s because they were in a high risk category and others who have comorbidities. That was the priority list. What happened and where are the ethics in that? Uh, actually, this priority list has been identified uh, for the COAX facility vaccination. So COAX facility vaccination, uh, that, that vaccines are due to come. During that time, Ministry has identified some uh, other vaccine stocks to receive to the country. Uh, based on that, the most priority group has been given, the healthcare staff uh, and the other um, uh, frontline workers. And then this uh, COAX facility vaccination is due to come in next, uh, maybe in next two, three weeks time. So that will be that priority group, the next priority group, about 60 is allocated for that priority group is still there. But considering the country most uh, uh, requirement of preventing the transmission, the ministry authorities have identified the uh, most high transmission, uh, prevention of the high transmission using the uh, existing remaining vaccine stocks, which has received to the country. But COAX facility, the priority identified for the COAX facility has not changed. It but will be continuing. Sorry. Why we wait for COAX to come? And I, 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 I'm sorry, I have to contradict this statement because it was not only for COAX. Mr. Lalit Viratunga's committee, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Somatunga's committee, we are talking about ethics, right? We are not talking about anything else. So I think ethically we have failed. So there's no point in talking and talking and talking about ethics. We have failed. Yeah, the same committees, same authorities have got together and decided on these uh, priority groups. The uh, because the now using these vaccines to most appropriately to prevent the uh, getting the maximum impact. That is what has happened actually. It is not individuals or the any uh, the implementation authority decision. It is the policy makers decision from the ministry. It has come from as like that. The decisions have come from the ministry authorities to get the maximum impact. I think this is an Hello. important point discussion. Uh, as per SLMA is concerned, we are yet to decide what has happened, whether it's ethical or not. So I think that we would be releasing our opinion with regard to uh, whether uh, the decision taken by the government is in uh, agreement with ethics or not. So thank you, Kumudini, for taking it up. It is open. Hello. Do you take it uh, questions from Zoom participants? Hello. Can I add? Uh, do you take questions from Zoom participants? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Can I, can I ask a question? I'm Dr. Senibirat Napa from Matara. Uh, could you hold on, Napa? Because there is a comment to be made. Yes, sir. Uh, the, considering the getting the most impact for the prevention of transmission, the ministry high authorities have considered the epidemiological uh, transmission aspect of the country also. But considering all these things, the ministry authorities have uh, taken that decision. Thank you, Deepa. Okay. Yes, Apa, you could, uh, uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. My my question is actually uh, related to uh, <clears throat> the vaccination of frontline uh, staff, and uh, I spoke to the epidemiology uh, unit also today uh, about this situation because 
uh, they are giving frontline they are considering frontline employees only at hospitals private hospitals not at medical clinics which i find is very unfair because in the com in the periphery uh, out of colombo especially it is the medical centers which are handling most of these first contact patients so uh, uh, when i spoke to the the epidemiology unit also they said they have taken a policy decision only the private hospitals which are registered not the medical clinics uh, which are registered with uh, the private uh, regulatory council so they are not giving and uh, it is very un unfair to consider the politicians uh, to be preferred over the frontline medical medical staff in the periphery to neglect to be neglected like this uh, and i appeal to the epidemiology unit to consider them this uh, medical centers also they also have the the medical staff frontline to be included in the in the uh, covid uh, vaccination program the question is clear thank you yes uh, i think sunil yapa I, i spoke to you already um, yeah uh, but regarding this uh, frontline health workers you know we want all the general practitioners everybody to be included therefore i'm uh, i'm sure that 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 you are included in the list but why we consider only the private hospitals is to is to avoid the calamity you know because we need all the all the all the necessary you know support in case of anaphylaxis and that's the reason that you know the only the hospitals were included but i think you are also included in the front end and you can you, you will be definitely given the vaccine to be taken in a hospital yeah. yeah thank you very much if you uh, if you have taken that request but unfortunately i have not been given any confirmatory message that uh, our frontline workers are getting it because i spoke to the chief epidemiologist this, this morning he said the our stocks are not enough to be given to the uh, to the uh, frontline workers uh, uh, at the moment this is the response i got this morning yeah we will we, we will try to take up the situation and then uh, instruct the yeah please yeah yes so this actually uh, this uh, based on the ministry high authority decisions uh this identification of this private hospitals and the private medical staff identified based on the registration procedure at the uh, private public private health sector regulatory council so they have identified the uh, different categories and different uh, um, the registration process and they have provided the list uh, and the all the private hospitals are considered all the general practitioners dental uh, dental surgeons registered they are full time and part time are considered and the medical center doctors are considered to get vaccination from uh, hospitals on wednesday and in failing on saturday so i think today and saturday so their facility provided in addition to the private health sector hospital registered identified and provided to because the uh, epidemiology unit has not taken the decision but the, the private health uh, sector regulatory authority has provided the uh, required lists to the epidemiology unit to provide vaccines so actually i think that one has happened uh, you are very correct in that sense deepa but the next is what was violated the people became little disturbed because the politicians were prioritized before the healthcare workers of smaller clinics so that's the place that he is with little bit disturbed so i think that there is a reasonable point in what he says so there is room for us to sort of address all these things so that uh, dr amal has said they are with me and he is in agreement thank you thank you padma i think you have uh, you have uh, amal amal and padma both understand the situation thank you can i think dr raj should be there when i ask this question uh, the who defines health as physical mental and social health so i'm contextualizing this question to sri lanka and with regard to the covid pandemic the ethics of all of this seem to be confined to mainly physical care of people so as a panel i think uh, 
Dr. Nakin also can respond because what about the mental health aspects? What about the social health aspects? And I think the Sri Lanka Medical Association has been, and the College of Community Physicians and so many other expert committees have been pointing out on particular social health impacts of the pandemic directly related to COVID. But these things, when we take it up with policymakers, number one, the decision making process in developing guidelines don't take into account ethical aspects. They don't take into, like Dr. Professor Sumitipali pointed out, uh, there are cultural aspects, anthropological aspects, which are deliberately ignored for reasons which are not shared with the general public of Sri Lanka. And upon asking them also, there is no valid medical background evidence given to us. So why is this uh, process, Sumitipali, Dr. Pense, uh, Dr. Ariratne, why is this obsession with physical health and ignoring and mental and social health when the WHO clearly says that all three dimensions should be addressed? I can answer. I can answer that question. At the very beginning, yes, the physical health was the priority. And I can assure you with the recent uh, review, Frontline staff burnout came as a issue. Mental health well-being came up as an issue. So I can assure you that the Ministry of Health and the Joint Operation of COID Center will be addressing all these issues now, particularly the burnout issues frontline as much as being vaccinated from one side, providing psychological support and all that. And again, that's why I mentioned with the WHO funding, we are looking into the coping strategies, resilience, mental health, comorbidities, all that. And we will have some data as well to back up all this. And it's, it's, it, it is taken care, but at the very beginning, you know, due to, I, I'm not trying to justify, but this is the nature of the complex emergency. Obviously, people were concerned about death, but not the psychological impact of death, because at the, at the very beginning, we had only 13 deaths. But even though it's 13, the, psychological and social impact of all that handling it is an issue now it's increasing so i'm pretty sure i can guarantee that you know the ministry of health and the joint operation command with our support will take due care and in, in the very future there'll be a lot of uh, efforts put in for vertical lateral communication efforts engaging the public and making them more partners than trying to impose things on them so that that is on, on the card They want to know specifically when the COVAX vaccines will be received, at least the first stock will be received by Sri Lanka. COVAX mechanism making in a vaccines. Uh, stock ke ke palaveni me work cover the other lanka over to humber in the young nikiela do we know a specific date in terms of uh, what uh, uh, dr ruvai sanifa mentioned i think so when we are looking at uh, ethic and ethical framework i think so the holistic aspect of health and well-being should be considered, especially if the way forward is to come up with a national ethical framework, uh, especially for, I mean, the context of the pandemic response, but moving forward on larger framework for health ethics. And it's absolutely critical. I think so that too much of a focus on the physical is also because it's visible. And generally what is visible is, is picked up and most of the other issues, especially the mental health and psychosocial, and we have been talking about it a lot, is that is something which is not visible. So it's very, very critically important. And thank you, thank you, Dr. Hanifa, for, for uh, bringing this up. In terms of the COVAX deliveries, a letter has already been issued to all participating members, countries, by the COVAX facility, uh, that the first deliveries would happen sometime by the end of February. They were awaiting a WHO EUL for the site, which is the Serum Institute of India, from where the deliveries would happen for the uh, AMC country. Sri Lanka is one of them. Uh, today, actually last night, there was another uh, email from the facility 
that uh, Serum Institute of India has already been instructed in terms of deliveries to the country. Uh, the deliveries will be done by UNICEF because Gavi just does the procurement. And there are uh, certain things, I think, so they are just awaiting the indemnification for, for the manufacturers specifically. And as soon as those things are done, um, we hope that uh, there will be an expedited delivery. And uh, the, there will be another letter that will be coming on 22nd of February, which would have further timelines and uh, indicative allocations um, for deliveries from March through May. So the country can expect the COVAX deliveries uh, in the coming weeks. You could can you? I think you are best. I think you are best to do that. Uh, no, no, good enough. Just a basic. Liung Yanwa Kela Hata in Hata, you not a Mema say Anti Mata, may Humber Vindathiana Covaxic, Humber Vindathiana, may vaccine sticker, Gataval Velata, Egolo Patanga Nokila Evanda, I think March to May, right? That will be the next tranche. The first one should be coming February, February, or May, February, Agha. So Sri Lanka will get the first first set. In the yeah. so, um, uh, Sri Lanka, they are very specifically interested in Sri Lanka, right? Palaveni stock acre, Mema se Anti Mata, Hambavena Kela, Covex mechanism maker tooling. Uh, how many would we know, Dr. Razia? Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but that indicative allocation would be communicated to the country soon. Oh, Tamadane Kuchara, Stokeka Kamba Venoma the Kiela, Eka, Milanka, but Egoluik Manata than Nava Kela Kiwa. Thank you. Yes, I want to respond to Dr. Wan's question. And uh, I fully agree with you that uh, mental health issues and mental well being has to be much more prioritized. And, um, and I think because you mentioned it's anthropological societal issue, and this is why I think the, the health sector alone cannot address this issue holistically. From UNFPA side, we, because of our mandate, we are focusing on the gender-based violence, victims and survivors, but there are many other issues related to mental health. For example, young people, adolescent mental health, uh, those of us who have uh, children at home, uh, schooling online, must know how it's stressful for teenagers to be, not be able to meet their friends and schoolmates uh, regularly. So I think that's the, the part that the education sector has to take forward this issue. And likely there are so many other issues that uh, employers as a you know, um, labor ministry or employer union, they have to talk about the employees' health and the mental health and burnout prevention and so on. So all of the society uh, type of effort is needed, not only health sector and the health sector is already I think very much overwhelmed and doing a wonderful job so I think we need to really help as a society uh, to address this issue and we have to bring up this issue continuously thank you since, since, since I want to leave it little early uh, just want to make a small comment you know uh, when it comes to ethics or sardarma you know uh, you know, we can always look at the whole spectrum of things which happen in a country. And then also we can select one outlier and then say that, okay, you have a whole operation and not been ethical. I think, you know, we got to look at the whole in general and then decide how ethical have, us have been. That's the most important thing. You know, when you make rules out of the rule, I mean, common things rather than the exceptions. Therefore, I think if you keep the two, two outliers side, but you know, make your assessment in general as to what has really happened. Talk to a lot of people and then see how many people are happy and how many people have got disturbed and unhappy. Therefore, I make that plea because otherwise the whole thing is it can always, you know, people who get the good service will never come and tell us, thank you very much. The health ministry had done a wonderful thing. I have I have I've been I'm very happy with the services. 
and and it's not fair by all the doctors in front end who have tirelessly worked towards helping a lot of people in the country and i think there are a lot of efforts have gone from the ministry of health and also from the government because about 100 million a day has been spent to do pcr alone therefore and then even 5000 rupees has come at a at a greater time you know 5000 is a big amount of money for a small family and therefore we have spent nearly 260 million alone in gampa you can imagine the amount of burden for a government to to contain this epidemic and 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 therefore i think there are a lot of positives that we see in the operation and there are also you may also see certain negatives and we would really like to see how we can cast away our weaknesses by your own nice and then get get all that to us we'll try to rectify whatever the weaknesses also to strengthen the strengths i hope that there are some suggestions coming from you these are good things you have done and we want to see that it's strengthened and therefore i think the best thing is to look at it as a management exercise and to let's agree what to do is the best principle to go forward and uh, and you know when it comes to making a change in management you need the top management commitment to do the change you need short term immediate results in the long term agenda for it to be successful the change and therefore total system involvement is needed as slma your support will be needed to do that change and therefore i think you know experimenting with ideas also will be needed therefore i think you know if you look at the precondition needed for a successful change let's look at those and then rectify some of these things and also strengthen the strengths of what we are doing on a day to day basis thank you yeah can i add to may that I, may i just add to that the media in general and the sunday times in particular has always written the positives of the health sector even last week we carried that and we have always written the positives we know that the health sector is under severe 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 challenge but dr amal sometimes exceptions matter absolutely and I when you it. make exceptions with strategy it matters yeah, just to add to what uh, dr amal hasil silva said what we need to understand as i said this is a unprecedented complex global pandemic so things cannot be perfect so i'm not trying to say things didn't go wrong as dr deepak amage very correctly said the context matter we are talking about public health emergency and there is also public health ethics where greater good for the good of majority and when you do that there are you know certain deficiencies which can come up i think the greatest message i want to say is, yes mistakes can be made that is very natural under circumstance but we should be flexible enough to pick them and correct them and learn from them and enhance the greater good and there will always be people who will find as a behavioral scientist i know that even if you do the perfect thing there will be a percentage of people who criticize i respect kumudani and and i knew her for 20 years she has never done that her paper we have to accept that the health system i am employed in uk but i talk worldwide the strength of this health system i am a strong defender of public health system of this country yes there are things but i don't think anybody would deliberately want to derail this and let's get together so i said gambaru muda satrani tani munsa jaya ganunata let's talk about learning from and marching forward i am a i am a malignantly optimistic person this health system with all the professionals will face this challenge and get over it i can vouch for that as a creation we talk about one minute madam uh, i think uh, all of you, all of us can feel we are navigating in the turbulent waters of covid 19 but we'll achieve the objective and i know all of us uh, all of you are supportive of that and uh, we have a request to establish a national ethics committee for covid 19 and we have prepared a letter to read a small part of it an increase in number of nations have created official bodies to provide advice to their executive and legislative branches and often to the general public about bioethics 
demand for such a mechanism in sri lanka to provide ethical guidance have grown significantly over the last few months definitely it will be a challenging task for the experts in the context of rapidly changing clinical social and political demands of this pandemic we can seek support from global health ethics teams in the areas of communication decision making in clinical care conducting research developing response to public health demands it is a timely need for sri lanka to establish an ethics committee at national level to assess the control measures data collection initiating research resource allocation and policy development in covid-19 so i request madam president padma gunaratna to hand over the letter to dr amar hasha desilla who is in the forefront of this war against covid-19 apa hitanawa me kalochita matrukawak api ada dawase katha karanne ethics gana ape sara dharma monada covid-19 me වසංගත තත්ත්වයේ යටතේ අපි හිතනවා විශේෂිත කමිටුවක් විශේෂිත දැනුම සහිත පුද්ගලයාගෙන් සහභාගිත්වයෙන් ලංකීය මට්ටමේ ආණ්ඩුවට සහාය වීමට සෞඛ්‍ය අංශයට සහාය වීමට පත් කරන්නේ නම් ඒක කාලෝචිතයි ඒක මැනවි කියලා ඉතින් අදාස පෙරමුණ කරගෙන අපි ලිපියක් සකස් කරලා තිනවා SLM එකෙන් ඒක අපි අපේ සභාපතිතිය වෛද්‍ය පද්ම ගුණරත්න මැතිනියට අපි ආරාධනා කරනවා අපේ ලැබර ඒ වගේම හිතවත් ඒ වගේම ප්‍රබල නායකත්වයක් දෙනවා ජාතික මට්ටමේ කොවිඩ් 19 වසංගත තත්ත්වයෙන් රට බේර ගන්න වෛද්‍ය විශේෂඥ අමල් හර්ෂ ටිසිල්ලා මැතිතුමා ask my question yeah 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 as clinicians we talk about total care of patients in the wards we always say the patient should be the total management it's not only really taking history and even treatment likewise do we have a total plan for the country in this covid situation do we plan it out in a total manner do we look at all the aspects why why there are, there are so many complaints because we are not looking at it in a total manner can i just yes thank you uh, kalyani i think uh, that's what the slm ethics committee is now raising this issue so much because yes there must have been total lack and also incorporating not only just healthcare alone everything together so this is the incent uh, the beginning of a big long journey and i do agree with you total care must be addressed very much wider broadly so this has sort of initiated our we have uh, brought out a big message here so we will move on from here this is just the beginning of a way forward penya you like to add to deepa yeah i very much hope so because i i totally agree with you at the very beginning one of the challenges was lack of you know we were you know it's it's like thrown into a deep sea so it's i have absolute confidence because i'm saying this the whole strategy has been reviewed recently by talking to everybody in the front line and lessons learned and the the strategy has been enriched revised in which all this would be taken care of because there are repeated things but what i am trying to defend i am not trying to defend you know the process in the learning curve this was something very new for us in every aspect so we had to learn in the absence of even global evidence so it, it is inevitable what i would say in a complex emergency as this nature particularly global there cannot be perfect ready made solutions available overnight but i am pretty confident that all the professionals would get together have their stake contribute of course there will be differences debates discussions 
But the only gap I want to see strongly uh, bridge this, Kumudhani, public engagement and involvement, their voice being heard, and that learn lessons are vertically and laterally transmitted. I think that is the biggest gap if we can bridge, particularly in Madhya Indonesia, Madhya Indonesia, Madhya Karibare, Puluang Tarang, Sadhaniya Vivechana Varta Gihing, Varadi Kiyana Vata Vada, Samahara Data Puta, Addakim, Vada Nivaradi, Udharne Passing, Idea Trohale, Rog Dostra Mahatru, Nurse Nola, Kamkar Mahatru, Rogi Ven Nati Aikiana, on the Pani Vide the Naker. Evage, uh, the Patian and Nuratian Spiritale, tell the near. Mang Mevage, Mevage, Honda Deval, Kian Moka, Hesitating Mata Pilima, the Visakni Pasa, Manasa Pilibanda, where the day negative Kaladun Hama, Janata, Apexa Banga, Tepateno, Jana Manasa Via Kula, Nokota, Ea Nivera di Karala. May Sadani, a caribari, believe it again. I may boom it up. Is Samasta Janata was saying, Vatak was saying, this one Paksagam, Ula bed and Ankala, Urtia bed Ankala got to Mamitana, Mia Bioga, Jagan, Puluan Kira, Ekanisa, but to Mia Kiana, the Disana Tianang, Padi Kira, Matahitana, a Sandha Kaurut, a Addeki Maran Yanakin with Sasset, Matati. One small question is uh, now uh, most of the discussion even today was based most, mostly on the vaccination. Uh, but I would like to draw attention, uh, how long will the process of vaccination take? And also in the meantime, how about the intermediate care centers, the quarantine centers, the other health aspects? Uh, uh, we have to maintain the same momentum on those, those lines also. So I think the emphasis on most of the media, everybody is now on the vaccination process. I don't think it should be the way because vaccination will take a long time and we will have a long gap before everybody is vaccinated and safe. So I think we should maintain the same momentum on the other aspects as well. I think we are missing on that. Thank you for the question. It's a very broad question, well valid, well taken. Uh, I don't think that say, uh, as long as they still may or the ministry is concerned that it's forgotten, uh, we haven't gathered all that who are the sort of in the front line or sort of uh, the decision makers with regard to all these things. I mean, my general knowledge on uh, viral infections, uh, based on that, I mean, you, I don't think that anyone could say that when this uh, pandemic would do over, because uh, we do not know the effectivity of the vaccination, we do not know the duration of the effectivity of the vaccination. We do not know the mutation, the next mutation that could come up and whether there would be a need for another different vaccine in another one year. So all these, there are so many unanswered questions that we, that uh, I mean, sort of uh, one will have to face uh, in and there as well as with the knowledge that any of this may emerge at any moment. Uh, so, uh, as far as the ministry is concerned, I mean, so sort of uh, the information that I have, they are ready with beds, they are ready with uh, ICU beds and the facilities and the uh, facilities for medical professionals, and they are trained. So, uh, I don't think that there is a need. Uh, I mean, say if you go by a lot of things that uh, has been, uh, I mean, so reports that's been released by the. Uh, WHO all over the world, maybe because of the vaccination plus other the precautionary measures that are being uh, sort of enforced. Uh, all over the prevalence of the disease uh, is coming down. I mean, every week that it's about 10% of the uh, case, uh, case load is coming down. So based on that, maybe it may not be immediately or, or about another two weeks. I mean, sort of one may expect or predict that the uh, prevalence may come down, but it's just an assumption. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, I don't think that government is neglecting or the Ministry of Health is not aware. Uh, but as at present, the most, uh, the, I mean, uh, the, the way out it appears that the vaccination is the most sort of uh, 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 reasonable uh, sort of option that is left while maintaining all, all the other precautions uh, that need to be taken to uh, minimize transmission. Can I add to that, uh, Padma? Yes, answering your question, I think uh, it has been clearly spelled out every newspaper. Every day says, you know, in spite of the vaccinations, don't give up wearing your mask, don't uh, keep your distance, wash your hands. 
I mean, every day the DGHS and all the authorities are focusing on that. So people must not worry. People also must be responsible. So actually, my question was based on just one uh, question that was asked at Gamma Pilisandra, where the president mentioned at one point, PCRs will not be needed in future because the vaccination is coming. My question was based on that. I, I don't have the authority to give full details for your question, but what I can assure you as somebody who was involved in a national review of the whole strategy, all of these aspects will be taken care of. I think the message to the public is vaccine is only one tool to prevent further spread. It's not an alternative. Primary prevention, the epidemiology unit is emphasizing secondary tertiary, but we have to, as I said before, we shouldn't just leave it to the professionals or to the health ministry to look after the health of people. We need to highlight the role of the public and empower them, engage them. Mata single note kyan na mad din na nisa. May saukya wagaki ma hudu rajya tavo saukya madhu matavo agam madhu janat mat baar dila epidemiology unit ka tabaar dene ka nimmay metna tiene may janasaha bagi tuing may khatte yutta samohi ka wagene ayam. Ennat karne ki ayne kadya kuitra ay pida na madhya samaning de tamai wagi matul ka wakami gulo katag. Abey madhya tat wagaki makti ay na may panivide ki ay na may ennat vikal pe ay ni may may ennat ekka aviyak pamanai. Ara mooli ka de ay tapiri si dukan ni ka pudgala duras ta baave. Ye wagi ma e saukhi awasya de tawean ki ay ni ka may ka samuhi ka wakala yutu wedak may ka di saukhi padhati ay tapitra ni may 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 saakat chawe no tawadar ni may ni ka ay burudhi ki ay ta madhya wedi ay ta srate pura wesi ay ta suwecha sangvidan wadi tera ni may. देश पान पक्ष वर्ट पवा मंग आदरे नहीं लेना वाम में का वस्तावक कर गाने पाक ये ला में नत करना वैध पीली वाला टाइ मुने अम्म हो बाद आवक फिर ना मुकदे नत करने अत्यावश्यी एक एंग सीए टा सीए प्रतिपाल नॉले बैंड पुलवा नमुत एक बलगतु अभियाक के ना पानी विदे देन के लमंग आदरे नहीं लेना माम एक ही � Any other questions from anybody? If there are any uh, questions from uh, from the uh, participants who have joined okay. online, may uh, unmute yourself and maybe that you could post the question. I mean, no, there are no questions. It's all right. Yes. Mahito no other Dabasiapi Sartakova may. Wedes ata ane mihewa, eki sampad daya ke sap sapeba ata pes tu tu mantu menawa, eva game ada mikir sabag ya, silum dina ata, awasan wasin ti ni, ape ethics committee ke cia person, Priti Vijay Gunawardana, wajdu tu ma, meki saaran sih, saha ape idri gamar gana, keti wacan soal pek katakara, ethening ada wedes ata ane Ibaru ni mau apa tu, no? Api ma silu dina, ma silu dina, benue ma obsah mata setuju antri no, boom setuju. Thank you, Suranta. Just a brief summary in point form because we are already running out of time. Starting from our president who talked about autonomy, beneficence, non-beneficence, justice. I think we as the medical profession has to be aware of all that all the time. So there are some non-ethical conduct of in the profession itself, sad to say, but we are trying to address all that from our ethics committee, not only with COVID-19, but right throughout in all our conduct. There are cultural and social economic contents of problems in countries. I think we are doing our best in our country. So I think we need to give time. That's the main thing, you know, with this issue. Every day new problems are coming up. So I. I think 
we are handling it and we as the medical profession must be alert all the time not only what the, the ministry is saying as a profession our responsibility to the public so all the time we i'm a primary care physician and i convey it all the time that people also must con be, be uh, cooperative in this whole situation uh, the strong recommendation again from uh, dr razia pense from the who also was about the national ethical committee which we are also been promoting and uh, we have already handed over document to dr amal harshadi silva as a resolution from this meeting and also she mentioned about guidance on research for covid which i think is also very important in ethics uh, research in this particular issue then mrs ritsu nakya from the unfo she particularly highlighted about women gender based violence reproductive age problems contraception disability and migrant workers migrant workers we also have to think of very seriously because we know there are a lot of problems with, with the migrant workers dr deepa gamage clearly spelled out the 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 policy of uh, the vaccination and of course uh, how the protection of the risk population first then the mandate for vaccination she was talked about and the enactment of a, of a vaccination policy which i think is very very important and of course the informed consent for vaccination again we forget all these things we can't just come and say come out take your vaccine and just force our people to it. we have to explain get their consent explain all the side effects future what not and the reassurance we can give them and of course she did mention about equitable access to vaccination centers ethics of that equitable access and of course social justice i think we can i don't want to elaborate because these are things we talked about and professor atula sumitipala one clear message never compromise on ethical obligations fantastic message atula i really appreciate that and our accountability as the medical profession to our people and of course equity and equality again she highlighted it very well and uh, so overall we have had a huge uh, wide spectrum of discussions on uh, ethics in covid but even beyond so first of all i must thank uh, uh, dr vinaya aryarath who brought up this topic in a suggestion in the ethics committee so basically one question do we accept that there are ethical issues in this yes 100% i think everybody will agree nobody will disagree we have a lot of wide spectrum of ethical issues in covid 19 and that needs to be addressed how should they be addressed i think we have talked a lot throughout this uh, two hours and of course that dr amar harsha said this is an experience this is a day to day experience we should look back for the past one year how we faced it day to day the new problems that came every day and we have faced it we have to reflect back i think reflection back is very important not only for research but in our conduct of daily life as a practicing doctors so it's very important to reflect back within the last one year what has happened and how we have got better how we have learned every day and how we move on so dr vinayarath vin arirath's topic right how do we move on from this uh, problem with the especially the ethics problem so i think we have sensitized our colleagues here as well as online all about this this is only the beginning of a long process of similar symposia that we would plan to conduct by from the ethics committee with the permission of the madam president and she is always supportive of us so thank you very much madam president for all your encouragement and i must mention one person who has been a live wire in this doctor our secretary to the ethics committee dr suranta pereira i as the chair i had very little to do just say support him and say yes 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 you are fine your ideas are fine so with that uh, i like to say thank you very much but to suranta am uh, mahitane uh, dr priti vijay gunawardena sir kiwage api mahajanatawata dena panwidiya saransha washin mokadda me ethics kiyen eka me sara dharma me api aachara dharma kiyen eka ithamata wedagat kotsak ape saukya sewe etoda apita 
එක පාටම මේ කොවිඩ් 19 වසංගත තත්ත්ව එනකොට මේකට මේ ආචාර ධර්ම පද්ධතිය සැකසිලා තිබ්බද නැද්ද කියන එක පොඩි ගැටලුවක් වුණා මොකද අපිට මේ අවස්ථාව සුනාමි වලින් පස්සේ අපි මේක හිතුවා මේ වගේ ආචාරම ධර්ම පද්ධතිය මේ වගේ කමිටුවා විද්‍රත් කමිටුවා ජාතික මට්ටමින් තිබිය යුතුයි කියලා නමුත් ඒක ඒ ආකාරයෙන්ම සිදු වුණේ නැහැ අපි හිතුවා මේ සැරේ මේක අපි මේ අවස්ථාව උපයෝගි කරගන්න ඕනේ අපේ වෘත්තිකයන් ඒ වගේම මහ ජනතාව දැනුවත් කරලා අපිට පුළුවන්ද මේක ඉස්සරහට සැලස්මක් ඇතිද ගෙනියන්න මම හිතන්නේ හැමෝම කතා කරපු දේවල් තමයි මේ ආචාරම ධර්ම පද්ධතිය මොකද්ද අපි මේ වැලක්වීමේ කටයුතු කිරීමේදී ඒ වගේම එන්නද්දී මේ කටයුතු කිරීමේදී ඒ වගේම තීරණ ගැනීම ඒ වගේම පොලිසි ඩිසිෂන්ස් අපි මොනවාද ජාතික ප්‍රතිපත්තිමය වශයෙන් අපි මොනවාද තීරණ ඒ වගේම අපි මේව කරගෙන යනකොට අපිට හඳක් නගන්න බැරි කණ්ඩායමුත් අපි එකට එකතු කරගෙන යන්න ඕනේ විශේෂයෙන්ම කාන්තාවන් සමරක්ලාට ආබාධිත තත්ත්වයේ පුද්ගලයෙක් වෙන්න පුළුවන් වයෝවෘද්ධකාය වෙන්න පුළුවන් විශේෂයෙන් වෘත්තිංගේ නියලෙන අය වෙන්න පුළුවන් අපිට සමරක්ලාට ඒක ළඟ ආමතක වෙන්න පුළුවන් ඉතින් මේ ඔක්කොම එක කණ්ඩායමක් හැටියට ආරක්ෂා කරගෙන ජාතික වශයෙන් වශයෙන් ප්‍රතිපත්තිමය තීරණ අරගෙන හොඳ වැඩසටහනක් හොඳ කාර්යක්ෂම විදියට කරගන්න පුළුවන් මේ විදියට මේක ගෙනියන එක අපිට අභියෝගාත්මකයි එතකොට අවසාන වශයෙන් අපි ඉදිරියේ මේ පිළිබඳ දැනුවත් වෙන්න ඕනි මහ ජනතාව තේරුම් ගත යුත්තක් තියෙනවා සෞඛ්‍ය අමාත්‍යාංශය වශයෙන් ඒ වගේ වෘත්තිකයන් වශයෙන් අපි අපි උපරිමය කරනවා නමුත් තමන්ගේ සෞඛ්‍ය වෙනුවෙන් තමන්ගේ කාර්යභාරයක් තියෙනවා ඒ ඒ හඳ මම හිතන්නේ අපි වැක්සින් දුන්නත් විවිධ ප්‍රබේද නැවත එනවා ඒකේ එතකොට මේ හැම ප්‍රබේදයක්ම म्यूटेशन अभी कहीं मेकिंग आवरण वाले गेट लॉक तीन नमुदू अपे दुरास्त भाव अतम इवे मुखावरण फैल बहुम सरल क्रम वेदन हर अभी पुलवांग मेक सहन दुर इतोट मेक एकांग अपूडी महाजन तावा सेवा वन लाभ नाय इतोट सौख्य से वृत्ति के हटि अभी सेवा वन सफे नाय अभी दिगुलम एक अरमुनाखरा मुखी निकतम अवसान वशीन अभी दिमा खटिटकर भूमस्तुति